This is uh, the session on high rainfall canola production strategies. And our guest speaker is uh, Heath Sanders. And Heath is associated with Great Plains Canola Association in Yukon, Oklahoma. And he received his bachelor's of science degree from an ag and an MS in plant sciences and in soil sciences from Oklahoma State University. Heath was the first winter canola extension assistant in Ennard, Oklahoma. He then worked for Producers Cooperative Oil Mill in Oklahoma City as an oil seed agronomist. And Heath is currently employed by the Great Plains Canola Association as a canola field specialist. His time is spent in the field or classroom educating producers and industry about all aspects of winter canola production in the southern Great Plains. Now you might even wonder to yourself, uh, what, what is it about Oklahoma canola that I want to know about? Well, canola is, is, if you think about this especially, canola is one of, it's a very widely adapted crop, first of all. It's grown in a lot of environments, grown all around the world. The only crop that I can think of that might be more widely adapted would be winter, something like wheat, which is grown in all kinds of environments. But canola is adapted to many environments. And many of the problems that they have in those environments, many of the, the things that we can learn from other people, are because of that adaptation, and uh, which can be then applied to our own situation here uh, in Washington or Idaho or wherever you're from. So w with that in mind, Please welcome Heath, as well as I will, and uh, we'll turn it over to him. Uh, well, thank you, Stephen. Pleasure to be here this morning, uh, a few miles away from home, originally from Oklahoma. And uh, I, I, as Karen and I talked uh, about coming up here and doing a presentation, I looked at the high rainfall and I thought, well, I don't know if that really portrays to, to my area or not. It should be more like dispersed rainfall because it'll, it, we get rainfall sometimes, sometimes we don't. Uh, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of what uh, I'm going to discuss and go over today is all the things that we have learned in the Great Plains about growing canola. We have learned a tremendous amount. We continue to learn, and we're going to continue to learn uh, as we continue to grow the acres. There's about 400,000 acres of winter canola in the southern Great Plains, which is southern Kansas, Oklahoma, down into Texas, uh, and we keep increasing acres each year. Along with that, there's all different kinds of production issues that you have. And a lot of my time is spent out in the field uh, helping, helping growers, uh, figuring out problems, uh, you name it, and, and, and try to be able to figure out what's going on. So a lot of the things that I will discuss today are things that were learned uh, through hard knocks. Uh, my, the professor that I was under at OSU or Oklahoma State, I got to specify that here, <clears throat> Uh, he, uh, he basically got the canola program started uh, in Oklahoma, and I was under him. But he basically told me, he said, you know, uh, education's not very cheap, but you, you tend to remember it. And a lot of the things that we'll talk about or I'll talk about today uh, is, is through education. Kind of give you an idea of the Great Plains Canola Association states. Uh, you can kind of see... Uh, there, uh, where the, the yellow is, is, is where we're growing winter canola. And yes, we also uh, have got Nevada and California, which I don't generally go out there uh, at all. But, but that kind of gives you an idea. The, the southern Great Plains is, is, the, is Colorado, Texas, um, uh, Kansas, and, and Oklahoma. Cover a lot of areas and a lot of different situations. So some of the challenges, uh, we're a wheat state, we're a wheat area. We grow wheat because it, it tends to work. It's, it's one of the crops that works. We grow it every year for generations. Farmers were reluctant to change, and we've got them changing. And they are really, things are really starting to, to turn uh, in our area. 
very little, if any, crop rotation, dual purpose. We, we, we graze, the, we get the wheat forage the pasture and we graze the cattle, pull the cattle off and cut the wheat and we just start all over again. That's generally a practice uh, in the southern Great Plains. But we're growing canola now and we're growing wheat and canola, we're growing winter crops uh, and, and it's changing the dynamics of the agriculture there uh, in, in the plains. Wheat infestations, uh, it's, uh, we got a lot of guys with a lot of problems with weeds, all kinds of weeds. It's very hard to kill the grasses out of a grass. You've got to be able to rotate your, your crops. Low profit per acre, 20 to, 30, or 20 to 60 bushel per acre yields. If we make 60 bushel wheat, that is a home run in our area. And uh, the state average wheat yield for Oklahoma is around 31.4. So uh, we've got to have crop rotation to take it to the next level. Some of the extremes, I, I saw this on Facebook, is actually the Oklahoma Mesonet, and it popped up, and I thought, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good slide, and I thought I'd just share it with you. And everyone has their extremes uh, in their area and some things that, you know, we've never seen this before uh, as far as the weather, but I can guarantee you since we've been growing canola, we have seen one extreme to the other. Uh, we've had more instances where well, we've never seen this before. And my grandfather's 90 years old. He's like, well, I've never seen this before. Well, if you look at some of the things that, that go on, you know, across the state, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. The one that really gets me is, is up there is uh, 87 degrees one day, changed to 26 degrees, 24-hour temperature change. And the next morning, we had canola encased with ice that was blooming on April 10th. First time I'd ever seen this. Now I'd seen canola in the snow before. I'd seen it when it was full bloom and got about 13 inches of snow and sleet on it, but I'd never seen the ice. This canola, what it done is after the ice melted, it, it came back up and started blooming again. Uh, yields were still you know, it, it depended on area, but 30 to 40 to 50 bushel canola uh, when everybody thought it was done. And so canola has got to work in our area because we have so much extremes thrown at it, and, and you never know what's going to happen. So why canola? Well, obviously, it's a broadleaf crop. Uh, we have more herbicide options. We're starting to see a lot of uh, ALS resistance problems with cheat. Uh, and Italian ryegrass. And Italian ryegrass is the one that really scares me the most uh, in our area. It is just a massive weed, grass weed, that will take over a field really quick. Profitability. And the, whole main, the main reason that canola was introduced into Oklahoma was to control the weeds. And now we look at it as a profitable rotational crop. It's right there with making just as much money as weed or more. Rotational benefits, disease insects, wheat improvement, the quality and the quantity. Uh, like I said, our state average wheat yields around 30, 31 bushel, and we've got to do we've got to do better than that. I mean, we're in an area where we get some rain, and we should be able to grow better wheat than than that. The market demand for healthy oil uh, is is huge. It continues to rise, and I think we're going to continue to see that. So today, as far as discussion, we're going to kind of go through, through some things, uh, seedbed prep, planting, fertility, uh, herbicide options, insects, insecticides, uh, and talk a little bit about harvesting. First off, field selection. We're basically growing canola in about every situation in any field that you can imagine, and I assume that's probably how each area has those You've got to be able to grow it on a wide scale area, and, and that's what we're doing. Uh, N, P, and K, and sulfur, we, we try to get a soil test. I mean, that is very key. Uh, if going out there and not knowing what's going on, uh, it, it's, it, the, the soil testing, soil sampling is huge. Starting to get a lot more soil grid sampling uh, being in, introduced a lot into, into Oklahoma, where guys are soil sampling on a five acre or two and a half acre grid uh, using their variable rate technology and, and stuff like that. So we're seeing 
and the, and the, and the harvest mapping and, and stuff like that. Uh, soil pH 6 and 7, we have a lot of fields in Oklahoma that's 5 pH and sometimes upper 4s. So we're trying to get those pHs up uh, as much as possible. Herbicide history uh, is definitely important. It's huge. It's huge out here, uh, especially where, where moisture is limited. Uh, we do plant cert tolerant varieties, and we've got to be able to know our herbicide history uh, going, into, going into the fall. We do not fallow. We basically grow wheat and canola and, and rotate, rotate them around. And so there's always a crop being grown each time every year on a farm. Seedbed preparation, I like to apply the, the pre-plant fertilizer uh, if we're in a conventional tillage system uh, right before uh, that final tillage operation. Uh, need a firm seed bed, we try to, you know, we try to firm it up, try to get some depth control on that small seed. S stale seed bed, rollers, packers, anything that takes the fluff out of the soil. Uh, obviously different situations for different areas uh, where you're at, this will work. The no-till, no-till canola production, I could, I could sit up here and talk till 6 o'clock tonight on what we've learned about no-till production of canola in, in the Great Plains. The big thing is residue management. Uh, the, the canola does not like the residue around it or in the row, and uh, we can get a stand, but we cannot hardly keep the stand over the wintertime. So... The big thing that we learn is canola likes a clean row. This is some of the, the issues that we have. You can tell exactly where the combine ran from the previous year, and all the straw was not dispersed evenly and spread out. Uh, we're getting better at that, but uh, you can see that the residue management is, is, is key. Here's another slide of, of Shelbourne stripper header straw that, that uh, was seeded with uh, 1890, I believe, air seeder that he had some row cleaners on. And, uh, you know, he got a stand, but it, it really didn't survive very well through the winter. Uh, and he just, the, the straw was so heavy, uh, just didn't have very good stands. So the residue management. We're starting to see more disturbance drills kind of come in. Uh, John Deere's Conserva Pack 1870, and that's actually a picture of it that went through uh, and, and seeded canola in, 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 uh, in no-till situations. We're starting to see more of those drills to manage that residue. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing about everything we can think of to try to manage residue and because uh, we want to go more no-till and direct seed. But, but dealing with the, the residue is what a lot of guys are, are still working on. One of the solutions was growing canola on 30-inch row spacing. Well, we can use a row crop planter, move that residue away, uh, plant it in 30-inch rows, uh, and, and we've got more options for row cleaners. So we're starting to see more of this. Uh, you obviously have to have a canola variety that branches extremely well and then also your seeding rates when you try to tweak it down gets to be a more of a challenge uh, on planters. Burning the residue, you can see where the, the farmer planted canola uh, on 30 inch rows in high residue and actually there at the top of the screen uh, some, they, another uh, actually Winfield had some plots and they burned the straw. Well, some of, the, some of the, the fire went into the farmer's field, and you could tell the exact line where the residue was not there. Uh, that canola was much greener and looked a lot healthier than where the straw was. This is some of the things, and I know John talked about it this morning, about the residue, but it is definitely th a thing that we continue to try to figure out what's going on. Yes, sir? The question was, did the canola come back? And we're going we're gonna to see this spring. This is actually this year. Good question. Best planting equipment? <sighs> Guys, there's a lot of different drills out there. And one of my jobs during the, during the fall 
is to help farmers calibrate drills. And you cannot, well, there's, there's 20,000 different types of grain drills and different attachments, different press wheels, different, I mean, you name it, it's different. But basically, we're trying to use some of the older equipment. Uh, you know, we've got grain drills with a lot of acres on them that we're trying to get set to plant canola. Obviously, operator's manual, uh, try to need to know where that's at. Slow down kits on some of the drills. Uh, the air seeders are not quite, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty simple. Uh, once you, if you can set an air seeder to plant canola or wheat, uh, it's generally right on the money. Some of the box drills, where we still have a lot of box drills in Oklahoma, we have to try to get those drills that's been set to plant wheat for the last 30 years to plant canola. And so four to five pounds is our rate that we try to shoot for. Uh, we will, uh, you know, row spacing was a huge thing. Well, we, you know, it, it's hard to get an older drill that's got a lot of acres on it to get shut down to plant four or five pounds out of each hole, which our row spacing is from seven to 10 inches. So what we started doing was plugging every other hole with duct tape to get these drills set that they would plant canola. It wasn't the fanciest, but it worked. And so row spacing was, you know, seven and a half, we'd plant on 15s. If it was eight, it was 16. We just plugged every other hole. And what we found out is there was no yield difference between a seven and a half or 15 inch row spacing, or what the data showed. So row spacing uh, is, uh, is a preference in our area. And, uh, you know, we're, it's just however the farmer's set up to do it. We try to plant from a half to an inch and a half deep, uh, especially in no-till, we'll try to go deeper. Yes, sir? Was there a yield difference in the 30-inch row? The, di the question was, was there a difference in yield on the 30-inch rows? Is that correct? And when you get above 20 inches wide, then you start seeing a yield decrease, is what the data showed us. Yes. How much? It depends on the year. It depends on the variety, rainfall, uh, from, from 0 to 10% yield decrease by going wider, especially after 20 inches. A good question. The last bullet point is slowing down. Okay, go And we thought about doing that and something to bulk it up to, yeah, that's a good thought. The, the, the question was uh, adding cracked corn uh, in, in a blend. Slowing down. I, boy, this was a, the last bullet point there, slowing down. That, this, this, we plant wheat in Oklahoma from 7 to 10 mile an hour. That, that's the range. And you go to a field and you see the power shift test of where, boy, slowed down, turned around, looked good, and it just disappeared. And I go, how fast did you sow this? Well, I was running 9.8, and I, I shut her down to 9.6 because I got better fuel economy. I'm like, man, you got to run around 5. So this was huge, and we finally are getting guys to slow down to plant canola and take their time. And what they're realizing is it's, it kind of works both ways with wheat and canola, but wheat is more forgiving. So Mark Bulls uh, at Oklahoma State put together a, a stand establishment, miles per hour versus plants per foot a row and, and a percentage of, of five miles per hour. When we increased to seven miles an hour, we lost almost 40% stand. I can drive a little slower for that because that's getting into some big bucks. So the main thing is to slow down. And everybody's in a hurry, and it's planting time, and, you know, you've got rains coming in, and everyone's on edge. But if you slow down, the stands are generally twice as good. Talk a little bit about fertility uh, and, and what we're using. We're going off of the, the two and a half pounds of nitrogen per bushel of canola, which canola is 50 pounds. Uh, wheat is 60 pounds, and we, we generally go two pounds of N per bushel on wheat. We're putting it down in the fall and the spring, 
from a third to a half of the end, sometimes two-thirds of the end in the fall, and then top dress with the rest in, in the fall or in the spring. Uh, the P and the K, uh, phosphorus and potassium, we're using the same as basically as wheat, or what the soil test says. We are banding in fur OP, uh, 1846-0, with the seed when we plant, but we're using low rates. And I'm talking low from 25 to 35 pounds of product uh, when we seed canola. Gives it just enough to, to, to establish a good root system and get it going. Um, and also depending on soil test as well. Sulfur, we're running you know, around tw 10 to 20 pounds per acre. Uh, some guys will run elemental, ammonium sulfate, fertilizer grade, uh, ammonium thiosulfate, liquid. Trying to get some sulfur out there because canola does require more uh, sulfur than, than generally a wheat crop will, being, a, being an old seed crop. Micronutrients, we're playing around uh, the boron a uh, little bit more, uh, but it is something that is being soil sampled and tested. Also, some tissue sampling uh, is, is being done at, o at Oklahoma State University. The problem is, is it, it changes so much that plant changes so much through the day in what hour, if it's cloudy, uh, out. I mean, there's just so many different things that that plant, whatever time that you pick it up for tissue sampling, uh, is going to tell you. So we're still learning a lot about that. And I'm sure you guys know probably more than I do about tissue sampling. One of my favorite slides, the influence of fertility. Had a farmer call me. I said, man, that canola looks pretty rough, and I know it's a little, probably a little hard to see uh, from the lights here. So I went out to his field. I said, what's this green strip? He goes, well, that's where my, my fertilizer spreader kicked on, but my spreaders didn't. And it dumped all the fertilizer out in a trail around by the gate. And if you look at what was fertilized and what wasn't, you know, it depended on how much he put out. So you might contribute to those smaller, weaker plants as being drought, you know, drought-related insects, bugs, but it's basically fertility. Uh, so the, the, the farmer obviously didn't put as much down as he, was, as he should have. Weed control, we, you know, depending on which system you're in, if you're conventional canola, uh, Roundup Ready, Clearfield, uh, you know, there, there are different weed control options out there. Assure 2 uh, and Select for, for grasses uh, in conventional canola. Uh, Broadleaves is, is a Stinger or Caplira lid by Dow. And it's, if you catch the weed small, it does a pretty decent job, uh, but it's not the best on mustard weeds. Grasses and broadleaves, you've got, you've got the Roundup Ready system. Uh, and we've got the PPI, Treflin, Trifluralin. Not very much of this is done. It, a lot of our canola is either Roundup Ready or conventional canola, and a lot of it's mostly Roundup Ready. Uh, you've also got the Clearfield system, uh, which is grasses and broadleaves as well. And, you know, make sure, I didn't put the labeled rates up here, but uh, make sure we read labels and, and look at labels and, and make sure that a lot of the, make sure the grass herbicides are put on before bolting. That's always a crucial time in our area because we'll go from, from being dry or then we'll be too wet and we can't get out in the field and we got weeds that need to be sprayed. Uh, and so we've got to really make some calls sometime whether to spray it or not because of the growth of the canola and how it's uh, growing so fast. So we like to get that on before, before bolting. And timing of weed control, rule of thumb, four to six weeks after you plant canola, spray it with a herbicide. That's what generally the, the, the data has shown. That's what I have seen. The longer we wait, you know, canola is not very competitive when it's small. But when it gets some size on it, it's pretty tough. But if you've got so much grass weeds out there uh, that's competing, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull it down and, and choke it out. Uh, this study was done by Josh Bichong at OSU, Oklahoma State. And uh, uh, worked with him for, for, well, I've worked with him for the last 10, 11 years. 
And, you know, basically we saw from the top of the point there at, at October the 23rd to, to not sprayed, it was 1.3 bushels a week we lost by, by waiting to spray. So if you've got problems with grasses, get them sprayed uh, pretty early in canola. This is another picture which is hard to see. Early spray on the left, late spray on the right, and you can see the damage that, that, was, that was done. Spray early. Uh, this farmer, I told him to spray it, and he had a different idea. And uh, we basically tiger striped the field when we had different sizes of plants uh, throughout the year. That is Italian ryegrass that uh, is behind the combine there from the, from the last year. Uh, so that's, uh, he still had a canola crop though. Shifting gears uh, again and talking a little bit about insecticide seed treatments. Uh, each, you know, all your canola seed that you purchase and buy will generally have an insecticide seed treatment plus a fungicide package on it. And I would not plant one seed of canola if it did not have it on there. Uh, firm believer uh, in the insecticide seed treatments uh, of keeping the aphids down. That's one of the issues that we have in, in the southern Great Plains are aphids. Um, it basically eliminates that early aphid pressure up till the fall. When we were planting canola in plots in Oklahoma when we first got started, we were spraying them about four times a year to keep the aphids out. And there was no way that was going to work. And so we put an insecticide seed treatments on and that has really boosted keeping our, keeping our numbers down. We've also got post-emerge treatments, synthetic pyrethroids, new products, uh, Prevathon, Transform, and Belief. We continue to see the industry respond uh, to newer insecticides, different modes of action. And so uh, we've got to have more tools in the toolbox uh, to, to grow canola and keep the pest out. Diamondback moth larva, when we, were, when we didn't have the insecticide seed treatments and we were spraying the canola, we didn't have any diamondback moth problem issues. So we put the, you know, we, we planted the seed with insecticide seed treatment on it, and then we just left it alone uh, throughout the winter, but we were starting to see a lot of buildup of diamondback moth larva. I mean a lot. And then also, army cutworms. You get a guy, you get a call from a farmer and says, hey, my canola didn't make it through the winter. You go out there and there may be six to eight per foot a row of army cutworms. The fields that were sprayed with an insecticide in the fall with their Roundup application didn't have the problems. It was where we did not spray an insecticide in the fall is where we were seeing the diamondback moths and then the army cutworms come in and just devastating stands. So each year we learn something new about canola and that, that was this year or the whatever year that was. I believe that was in 09. Three aphids in canola, uh, green, or turnip aphid, green peach, and cabbage. Uh, turnip and green peach we'll have this time of the year in, in the southern Great Plains. And generally about when we're flowering, we'll, get a, we'll sometimes get a flush of cabbage aphids. And uh, I'm sure it, is every, everyone up here has seen aphids in canola before pretty well. Well, they, uh, they, je they definitely come in numbers when they start showing up. And they'll generally, you know, if you're not scouting the fields pretty regularly, uh, you'll start to see the spots show up. And uh, got to look on the bottom sides of the leaves uh, in order to see this. But uh, when you start to see this many aphids, uh, you know, you've got to get it sprayed. Or it's just going to, every three days they double in population. So if you, the, more, the longer you wait, the more you've got to try to kill. So a lot of guys practice and, and it's probably not the best IPM management. But when we make a herbicide run in the fall, we throw in an insecticide. When we make a herbicide run in the spring, say February 1st of March, we throw in an insecticide. 
to take care of some of these problems and some, some diamondback moss that we may have not have got. Uh, when we do that, we keep our, we keep our numbers down. <coughs> Insecticide applications, coverage is key. Uh, more carrier volume, the, the better. We've got a lot of guys that want to throw everything in the tank and head to the field. That's the fertilizer, the, the Roundup, and, and the insecticide. And I really like to see that split into two applications, herbicide plus insecticide and then, or fertilizer and insecticide, or just run fertilizer. Um, that's just, and we've got guys getting away with that and it's working, but you know, I've seen it where it hasn't worked as well. Basically, the efficacy of the, the, the herbicide that you're trying to put down is, is, is not working as well with the fertilizer being in there. <coughs> Harvest management. This one here is, is, uh, is, is my favorite time of the year uh, is harvesting. And uh, probably should have mentioned but when I got started that I also farm in southwest Oklahoma uh, with my dad and uh, been growing canola for the last seven yeah, around seven years, and incorporating uh, uh, incorporating it with other crops. Harvest management is 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 one. Of, it's basically a preference. What do you prefer? What works best for your area? Uh, do I push? Do I swath? Do I straight cut? I can tell you that all the canola in Oklahoma was going to be straight harvested in 2005, but I could not get a wheat farmer to pull out of a wheat field to cut canola. He wouldn't do it. He's comfortable cutting wheat. So we had to look at other options to prepare this crop because canola has a tendency to shatter. So basically, everybody, everybody farms differently, and that's one of the, the freedoms of farming is that we get to do everything differently and try to figure out how to make that operation work into our op into uh, our operation. So we'll kind of take a look at the different methods that we've used, we've tried, we continue to use, what kind of works the best. A couple years ago we had uh, uh, Ag Shield out of Canada come down and demo some pushers and uh, uh, the, the pushing technology which you know when I, I think about it you know we're going across this crop and we're pushing it down you're like oh my gosh. Uh, it worked really well when we had good tall canola. But when we had thinner, smaller, shorter, drought stressed canola, it would not push. It would pop down, pop back up. So we learned we needed height uh, in order to, uh, to push canola. Uh, we could push earlier than we could swath, and we could push more acres with a swather, or more, we could push more acres in a day than we could with a swather. Uh, so we learned a lot about this, and it was not a bad, uh, it, it worked pretty well, it just, you have those years where it didn't work. And so, uh, you know, a lot of guys kind of steered away from it. Harvesting push canola, you, you know, obviously you go the opposite direction. Generally two to three weeks after you push it, we were harvesting, and that threw us right into the window of cutting wheat. The canola and wheat was ready at the same time. Well, here's a, you know, I'm a wheat farmer too, and it's hard to pull out of that wheat to go cut canola. But obviously, price difference per pound per bushel uh, was driving what, what the farmers did. Had some guys use some stripper headers on, on push canola. Uh, that was a very interesting day. You know, it worked really well. If you had a good, thick uh, stand, a, a crop that was matted down, and that stripper header pulled that vacuum and, and worked really well, uh, I thought, because I was out there trying to count seeds and I couldn't really find any. Um, but obviously, if you've got you know the flex headers, the draper headers, uh, these guys are using all different kinds of headers to cut canola that's pushed, taking in more more residue. Stalks are generally greener. Uh, sometimes we will have to spray a desiccant on the push canola because it tends to green up, regrowth. It greens back up on us. Uh, so it sometimes will add more. A lot of guys 
method of harvesting is swathing. Uh, we're swathing canola at 40 to 60 percent color change. And uh, the main thing is time. Guys can swath canola, get it picked up, and then go right into wheat harvest. That's what they like about it. And it's not, they don't have two crops at one time as they're managing the timing of their crops. Have to use a draper header, uh, and then also a packer or roller is preferred. And what that packer and roller does is it presses that windrow down into your stalks that you have left, and that basically anchors your plant from blowing. Swathing direction is huge. We try to swath in the way that our winds, the prevailing winds are. Because if you do it in another direction, they'll sometimes want to pick up and move on you. Even maturity, time management, like I said, this is probably 90, I'd say 85 to 90% of the canola that we're growing now is being swathed and picked up. Picking up swathed canola, uh, it's uh, a lot of guys really uh, are enjoying it. It's different. The biggest thing is, is uh, you know, you're used to a big header and you pull up by the truck you, don't, you can't judge your distance with your auger in your, in your header anymore like you normally can. And you'll shoot that, that canola on the back on the other side of the truck when you go to empty it. Uh, but it's, it's, working, it's working out. We've had canola in windrows up to two weeks, and, we've, and, and we got around 20 inches of rain during that harvest time, and, and they stayed in the windrow, and we were still able to harvest canola. So we were very pleased with, with, with that. Yes. The question was, do you have to use a uh, draper-headed swather to to swath canola? And the answer is yes. Yeah, we tried to take the crimpers out. It the the way that the reel is positioned with the auger, uh, it's just it's too damaging. Canola is a lot. It needs to be delicately, you know, dropped and placed. In that windrow. Yeah. Well, we're, we're using grassy well, a lot of it is trying to get all the material out right. of the machine, and especially if you're in really good canola. <laughs> We've also got guys swathing canola with their draper head combines, taking the belts off of the machines and just running the header and shooting that windrow out of each side, putting two together. I mean, there's all, and they build them some rollers for the ends of the headers where they could pack the canola. Uh, there's all kinds of deals that, that, that guys are, are improvising to, to swath canola. Obviously, I like the swather. Desiccants. Uh, we've got more guys putting on some desiccants than when we did. You know, Regalone or diquat is what's labeled. Pint and a half to two pints per acre and a good surfactant with that. 15 gallons of water, I like to run a good 20 to get that coverage down and through that plant and get it, and get it uh, terminated. Seven day pre-harvest interval, that's what the label says, but you give the right conditions, I bet it'll be ready in three or four or, or sooner. And the big question is, do I want to spray all my acres in one day? Well, if you can get it all harvested in one day and it's all ready, then yeah, but a lot of times we spread out uh, the acres with the varieties and so that not everything is, is quite ready uh, all at the same time. But if you have large enough acres, it would be. Direct harvesting, you must harvest when the moisture is below 10%. Yes, we're still going to have some green pods, some green stalks, some uneven maturity. Uh, if we don't put a desiccant on, if we do put a desiccant on, then it's, uh, it, it'll generally work really well. Most risky probably operation in our area because we have so much wind and you have a ripe crop that's this tall and it's doing this in a 40 mile per hour and it's 100 degrees, you know, it, it, it's kind of sickening sometimes. But in, the, in, in everything that we've done, when everything's perfect, this is the best method because you touch it one time but it's just hard to get everything perfect all the time uh, in order for it to, to, to direct harvest it in a timely way and, and, and obviously obtain the, the most uh, profit. 
So in summary, uh, canola does require more management than wheat. Plan ahead, get a soil test if you're thinking about growing canola, paying attention to the details. I think that's one of the biggest things that I've seen is we're paying attention to our canola and that's rolling over into our wheat more. Um, be committed, have a harvesting plan. We will sometimes have three harvesting plans. And I'll give you an example of this past year. We were gonna swath some canola around Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Well, that's when the May 30, 31st tornado came in and it dumped 11 inches of rain uh, right when we were needing to swath canola. We couldn't get the swathers in, so we had to direct harvest a lot of it. So having a plan A and a plan B sometimes is what you have to do in order to get it done. Time management uh, is definitely crucial with this crop from the time you plant it to the time you harvest it. Time management is extremely important. And a huge thing that I've noticed is that growing winter canola has resulted in, in better wheat farmers in our area. And uh, we continue to see that. Uh, it's a great crop for us. We have learned a lot. We're going to continue to learn a lot. Uh, but a lot of guys are making this crop work for them. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? You talked about, so you're on the harvesting of work pushing versus swathing. If you went out and swathed it, pushing you harvested it two weeks after you pushed, swathing you average seven days and make it took a week off during the black time. Right. And keep in mind that May is our severe weather time that we're trying to get that crop out of the field. That's generally what the you know the difference is. Uh, I look at when I get my canola in the, in the windrow at home, I can sleep better at night. Because I know within, you know, sometimes it's five to six days we're picking up canola. And I've seen it as quick as three when we got up to 105, <laughs> which is not good on windrowed canola that needs to take its time to, to change the chlorophyll of the seed. But we have seen that. What kind of uh, the question was what kind of yields? Well, we shoot for 40 bushel. That's kind of our yield goal, and that's what I recommend, you know, uh, for guys to fertilize for. It'll be all over the board from 20 to 60. Uh, we had some guys with some 40 bushel canola, 45, some 50 last year. We try to, we try to get in the 30 to 40 bushel canola range acre per acre. Yeah. The, the, the question was how much – let me see if I get this right – how much nitrogen – are we putting on uh, different times of the year? We did a, uh, when I worked for Oklahoma State University, uh, we did a kind of a timing trial with, with different times of the year. Two, two or three years in a row, a third of the nitrogen in the fall and two thirds in the spring was the best. Then we went two years where it was better to put all the nitrogen on up front. And then there was years there was any, not any difference. The big thing is, for our winters, we have to have a pretty healthy plant going into the, going into the fall. And so if we have, you know, we try, I like to put down at least half, maybe, maybe a tick more than that. And then we top dress the other half in the spring, given with what, you know, weather conditions we have at that time. The question was, is uh, how much credit uh, is left over from, from a canola crop as far as nitrogen? You know, there's a lot of things going on with, with this uh, canola wheat rotation that uh, is, is, blows my mind, uh, especially I'm seeing it at home and in and, and, and the farming that we're doing. But we are keeping our costs down a little bit more with the nitrogen. We'll generally tend to have 30 to 40 to 50 pounds left after growing canola when everything breaks down the plant that you know everything decomposes will generally be somewhere so you're going to have some credits left in the soil following canola but i don't think that's all that's what's going on is, is you know why it's you know why it's utilizing that nitrogen so much better you know i, I don't know but uh, we are trying to keep our costs down with the nitrogen input with the wheat 
following canola. So the question was, is what is the rotational benefit of uh, wheat following canola? <clears throat> I can tell you personally, it's about a, we're, we're getting at home about a 25 to 30 percent increase in our wheat yields. I talked to a farmer, I, I go to a lot of meetings, visit around with co-op managers, grain handling facilities. There, I, and one guy the other day was like, he, he had a, his neighbor planted a quarter of canola and a quarter of wheat, cut, harvested it, planted it back to wheat. On, on both farms, there's a 14 bushel difference. That's pretty significant in our area, 14 bushels. And going from a 30 to a 44, 45 bushel yield is pretty big. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that 20. Sometimes the highest I've seen is around 50%. You know, and that's just kind of what, you know, the, the year is. When one of the 2011, we had a, a guy down in southwest Oklahoma, extremely dry. He had a field of canola. He split it in half. Where he had wheat on wheat, it made 10 bushel. And keep in mind, this was in the middle of a drought. Same fertility, same wheat variety, same everything. The line in the field, you could see right to the line, wheat falling canola made 25. And that's pretty significant. But we're seeing the huge bump, uh, we call them huge bumps, uh, in our wheat yields. Yes? Quality as in dockage or as in, oh, yes. We're, uh, we've got some situations where, uh, if I could go back here, if I can, maybe, where it looks like he's basically got a rye problem in his, or a wheat problem in his rye. You know, I mean, it's, feral rye is, is, is one of the big ones at home. Um, Wild oats, Italian rye grass, jointed goat grass, uh, rescue grass. Uh, I'm trying to get back to that slide. That there we go. That's actually a. Well, that's hard to see, but that's actually we've got a lot of feral rye issues. And one year of canola back to wheat, we're getting about 85 or 90 percent cleaned up. And then we start over again in two or three years because the dockage in the FM gets back up there. We're trying to be on the one-third rotation. So a third of our acres each year are rotated to canola, and then we're back again. So we've, got, we've still got a lot of work to do on cleaning up wheat fields, but it is getting better. The dockage is going down. Actually, it has kind of started coming down for our state. Dockage, as far as overall, and FM has, has come down a little bit in the last year or two. So the question was, uh, are we seeing diseases such as blackleg and sclerotinia in our environment? The, the answer is yes, we are. Um, the blackleg has been very interesting. Uh, we'll see it come in in the fall, or we'll see it come in in the spring about, about the time that flowering's over with. And so we're trying, we've got some blackleg studies going on now at, at Oklahoma State. Uh, Dr. Jan, uh, Dr. John Damacone has been trying to grow blackleg plots. I mean, he's inoculated, he's done everything uh, to get some data out of that. And for right now, we're not seeing a huge problem with blackleg. As all the seed is is uh yeah they're they're i don't know if they're certified they'd have to be certified black leg uh but they're open pollinated uh, or hybrid canola varieties that we're using i think a lot of it is do what right like i said we're just starting to see some black leg um we know it's coming. I don't think we've grown canola enough to know, it, you know, how detrimental it's going to be. We will see some sclerotinia, but it's, it's a give and take. We, sometimes we'll see it, sometimes we won't. So right now, the diseases uh, are not basically a limiting factor, but I foresee that being on the radar. 
the question is, is uh, what is our crop rotation interval with wheat and canola, basically? We cannot grow, and the way that the ins crop insurance is written, is we cannot grow back-to-back -back continuous canola. We've got to rotate it with some other crop for that year. So we will go, we've got guys that are going a third of their acres, a quarter of their acres. We've got guys that are, that are going half their acres. They're going half wheat, half canola, and they just keep rotating it. But we've only done that for the last three or four years where we're doing half of our acres and half back and, and, and trying to figure out, you know, how to work that. There's areas in, in, in Oklahoma that's 120 years continuous wheat. And all that's ever been done is wheat. So that's kind of, we're, we're trying to do the one out of three years is what I recommend. Uh, but it's, uh, we're, we learn something new every year about canola and we're gonna continue. So right now we grow, uh, the, the question was uh, if we can get everybody in Oklahoma on a one out of four year rotation uh, with canola, uh, with their winter wheat. We grow around five, five and a half million acres of, of wheat right now. And what's actually harvested is probably closer to four because of our weed problems. So about a million acres. And I look at it too as you're gonna increase, and, and sometimes the, the, the wheat commission was a little skeptical about taking those acres out for wheat production, but you're actually increasing bushels per acre with 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 less amount of land. So we're going to we're starting to see that we're starting to see more storage being built, and it's going to have to be built by somebody uh, in in our area because when you increase when you start growing canola, you're going to start increasing bushels of wheat. And so you have to be able to take that in at the same time of the year. Okay, so the question is, what are the acres of no-till versus conventional till? And then wheat acres versus uh, and canola? Uh, we're getting more and more no-till canola being planted. I would say probably probably a third of the acres down there are no-till and no-till wheat straw, wheat, wheat stubble. If you looked at the, uh, the no-till wheat acres, I'd have to go back and look at all that again. But obviously, if you look at the system together, we're probably 35% no-till and 65% conventional till, if you looked at the state on all crops, uh, wheat and canola. So does that kind of answer your question a little bit? We're wanting to go more and more direct seed, no-till. You know, at home it's called no-till, and here it's direct seed. Uh, I like the direct seed method better than the no-till method. Uh, we use a lot of disc opener drills, and, and we just don't cut through the residue like we need to. Uh, different openers, different things like that. So we're still tweaking and working a lot. On, on, on which planters, seeders uh, work the best and which openers work the best and, and, and everything, trying to, trying to make it work. Oh, okay, so the question is, so much, so much of our crops are, are custom harvested. Is there problems harvesting both crops at the same time? No, no. Well, you can generally see that in the summer, <laughs> where they did and didn't. Uh, that doesn't seem to be much of an issue that I've that I've worked and worked with those guys. We have gotten a lot of guys that were willing and ready to bring their equipment down, uh, you know, to, to to help get the crop out. Um, there is more guys with swathers, custom swather uh, guys that are running three or four machines and they start in southern Oklahoma and work their way into southern Kansas just all they do is swath and uh, and then and then the the custom guys will be right behind them picking up canola getting ready to to cut wheat for the guy that they come down there for 
but we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of, we've got a custom harvest list that is put together, and it's on the Okanola website, and it's about, oh gosh, it's probably close to six, seven, eight pages long of, of people cutting, coming down and, 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 you know, swathing or picking up canola. So it doesn't seem to be that much of a, much of a problem. Yes, sir. So the question is basically preparing a crop for harvest, uh, keeping it from shattering. And we have done some work with that before on applying the, the, the pod seal or spodnum. Um, the research plots, we didn't see anything. We didn't see any difference. We did take it to the farmer field, and we split an 80, 40 with, and 40 without. And we cut them separately and weighed them separately, and, and you know, we didn't see any difference. But it depends on the year. It depends on the situation. I mean, there's so many different variables in that. Uh, but it didn't show that it, it, it really worked for what we did. The big deal about, about swathing, and, and, you know, everybody wants to get out in the field. They want to get something done. One guy wants to be in front of his neighbor, you know, a few hours out in the field. And uh, the, the swathing, because they're, they're on such a time crunch of, to get that canola out and to go into wheat, it allows them to get started on something first. And, and that's why we're doing that. Because if we can get it in that windrow, we know within a few days we're getting it out of the field. And so that is a huge, you know, especially in our time of the year when we get tornadoes and hailstorms. And but it doesn't hold down for tornadoes. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to get stuff, you know, we're trying to get stuff out of the field as soon as we can. But quality as well. Yes, the, the question was, do we get enough annual rainfall to reseed a crop each year? And yes, we do. We will plant wheat after wheat or wheat after canola or canola after wheat each, each, each fall. And we will generally be seeding September 10th through October 10th on the canola. The wheat we will plant up into the end of November. Great questions. Uh, I really appreciate the interaction and I really appreciate being here. So thank you all.